Hi, everybody. Uh, this talk is Web App Builder for ArcGIS Advanced Development Tools and Techniques. My name is Gavin Raykemper. I'm a developer in Esri Professional Services. I'm George Bohenik. I am also a developer in professional <laughs> services. Uh, so thanks for thanks for coming right before the uh, right before the party. Uh, we're super excited to uh, to lead into that. So hopefully we can uh, get you a few more things to learn right before we uh, head outside. Yeah, I mean, you guys can think of this as the pre-party before the party. Yeah, pretty much. So during this talk, we're going to share some of the advanced workflows that George and I have been working on over the past few years. Um, if you've been doing development for a while with Web App Builder, um, we're hoping to make your life easier as a developer and push you kind of to your next level or next step, making applications truly performant and production ready. Even if you're uh, brand new to the, Arch to the Web App Builder ecosystem, these tools and techniques are going to be useful in planning new architectures and getting your systems off the ground. So some of the workflows that we're um, trying to go through here are the uh, Web App Builder um, Yeoman Generator, which will allow you to quickly and easily generate widgets um, and developer tooling. And always shut down your chat apps, right? Um, we also want to talk, we're also going to talk through the Esri Web Build. Uh, George is going to talk about that. We're going to talk about um, wrapping your widgets uh, so that you can kind of have generic widgets that you write and use m multiple places, including Web App Builder, um, other best practices, and then we'll get to a Q&A. So Web App Builder, as we, pro well, let's see, who's all used Web App Builder here? Okay, we all have, so I'll kind of skip through these these um, intro slides pretty quickly, but as we know, um, it has this great builder interface for our users to be able to build apps really quickly and easily. And we as developers can create customizations, including what custom widgets and themes to put into um, these apps. We found that, you know, Web App Builder is super popular, particularly because um, you can build apps so quickly and easily and create them really, uh, create a lot in a short amount of time. Um, but um, we, we still find users that are using Web App Builder when they might, they probably should be using a custom web application using the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Um, web App Builder is great for certain situations like if you're building a multi-purpose app or if you want to create a bunch of similar apps with the same data and different sets of widgets, and maybe some of those widgets even being custom widgets that you've built. But if you're, for other situations where you're building like a super specific or custom app, a complex app where lots of different widgets or areas are interacting with each other, it, it's still totally valid to build a custom application using the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Um, but the great thing is that the same skills that you have um, building custom JavaScript apps and building custom Web App Builder widgets and themes are basically those same skills, and so we can utilize them and vice versa. So today we're going to talk about um, a couple of tools for development and some best practices. The first tool we'll talk about is the Web App Builder Yeoman Generator. Uh, before we get into that, you may be asking, like, why do I even need tools to develop? Um, the most basic setup for developing widgets is just to kind of copy the widget and get going and just develop right on the JavaScript files right there. Why do I need any tools? Um, the GUI WYSIWYG editor is super powerful, allowing non-developers to build apps, but it comes at a cost because it adds complexity to the system. What's easy for configurators is hard for developers, or it adds, adds uh, complexity for developers. So generators allow us to automate this extra work for us. You have all these extra tasks that you want to do when you're creating a custom widget or theme. Uh, for example, you have to conform to the strict widget file structure. You have to make sure copies of your widget are in the stem app and the server folder um, if you're testing with a real app. And so that's why it, it, it generators kind of help us. They also scaffold out boilerplate code for us automatically, and they install and configure tools like Grunt or Gulp to automate tasks for us, which is particularly helpful with opinionated frameworks because the more opinionated a framework, uh, the more value you can, you can get out of generators like this. A great way to think about Web App Builder as a developer is as an opinionated framework that sits on top of the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. 
And by that, I mean there's a heavy use of convention. Um, every widget um, has to have a manifest.json file. It has to have a widget.js file. And then it expects all these other files to be named precisely the, the correct way. Like if you're using a config.json, it needs to be named that way. And all these folders need to be there as well. This convention style is um, is, is very uh, popular, like in like Ruby on Rails community and other tech communities, and so it, Web App Builder is kind of following these patterns. So we want to set up the same automated tasks for most projects, and we have a lot of boilerplate code and files that need to be uh, created during our development. Well, that's a perfect situation for a generator, which is why we this generator was created about three or four years ago to help out uh, us on a few uh, professional services projects and lots of people in the community found it useful so it's an open source project that's you know thriving today you know getting a lot of enhancements from you the community as well as us at Esri when when we're able to contribute back if you've never used the generator before, its main two purposes are to install tools to transpile and copy your code into the Web App Builder folder. And it has a sub-generator to scaffold out widget files to save you time, so you don't have to create all of those yourself. Um, the pro each year we try to add um, more functionality and the open source community um, have added more features to the generator to make our lives easier as developers. This year we've continued to, in, in last year we, we put in TypeScript, this year we've continued to improve ty the TypeScript support. We've upgraded to the most recent TypeScript updates and, um, and we've included some new paradigms for using TypeScript within widgets. We've also created a bunch of, uh, or put in a bunch of bug fixes, um, like, uh, and another big feature is that we have um, better integration with app builds, and George will talk about these features later. So, um, yeah, we've added a lot this year, and we hope that you can take a look at it. But um, we'll jump into a demo of the generator right now. So, the first thing that I want to do before developing is to have a demo app that you're already using. So I've already downloaded Web App Builder from developers.rgs.com, and I've I've uh, started up with uh, startup.bat, and I've got it running right here. I've created a uh, a uh, app, and if I open it up, it's just a basic 3D app. Haven't had it made too many changes to it. Uh, you can see the ID in the URL. Um, well, you might not be able to see that, but it's uh, the, you get the ID from the URL. In this case, it's ID three, and that's going to kind of come in in useful later. So the next step is to move over to our command line um, to install the Yeoman generator. So the first dependency is Node.js. I think most of us in the who are developers probably have Node.js installed. Uh, right now you need Node.js to run Web App Builder, so you need to make sure that's installed. Um, next, uh, next we actually do npm install, uh, let me clear this, npm install yo, dash g. So that's gonna install this thing called Yeoman. Yeoman is, uh, Yeoman's kind of the underlying framework that we're sitting on top of to be able to create these templates that can put, can scaffold out these, um, all these files for you. So that's why you need that installed. I'm not actually gonna run that because that takes a little bit of time. Next I need to actually install the templates, the actual Esri App Builder um, Yeoman generator. Um, because Yeoman doesn't actually do anything out of the box. Um, you need to install these templates for it to work. So to install that into Yeoman, we'll also use npm. I'll do npm install dash g generator esri app builder js. Um, so that's going to, ins again, install that, that uh, generator for us. I'm also not gonna do that here because that's gonna be a one-time install. So now we have all the dependencies all set up. We, now I'm gonna basically create a new folder here. So this new folder is going, or I already am in that folder, but this folder might represent like your Git repository um, if you're creating a new project, and it can really be stored anywhere on your computer. Um, so I'm gonna go to that empty directory and just type yo to start up Yeoman. 
it's going to um, open up and list me all of the uh, Yeoman generators that are installed on my machine. So you'll see it's got a nice CLI interface, even though you are in the terminal, um, it kind of makes it, a, has a little GUI kind of interaction. So I'm just using my up and down arrows here to scroll through this list. I only have one generator installed, the Esri App Builder JS, so I'll go ahead and select that by hit, hitting enter. And it even says here, make sure you are in the directory that you want to scaffold into. So now it's going to ask me a few questions about my initial project. Um, these are going to be project level um, settings. They're not we're not going to generate the widget yet. That's going to be next. So in this case, we need we're going to be um, your your Yeoman project uses the same settings, either 2D or 3D, for all the widgets. Um, so you, so you choose that first. I'm going to choose 3D since I have a 3D app that I'm testing with. So then I'm going to ask for the install root. That's going to be the root directory of where you're running your web app builder, basically where that startup.bat file is. I'm just going to copy that directory from my Windows Explorer, paste it in, and hit enter. So now the generator is going to go out, look at the, my Web App Builder install, and read through all of the apps that I currently have running, or sorry, stored in my Web App Builder Developer Edition. And I have those two apps that we saw earlier, and I'll select the one that I want to test with over the next, you know, for my development, and that's this 3D app. It's next going to ask if we want to use SAS for CSS preprocessing. If you haven't used SAS or SCSS, it's a really great kind of CSS uh, library that allows you to write your CSS code in a in a more compact and easier way with variables and a ton of different nice nice features. And we have that built into our tooling here that you can use if you'd like. So you can choose yes or no, not not to do that. And I'll choose yes. The next question is, what kind of JavaScript syntax do you want to use? We have a variety of options here. We can use plain old um, JavaScript, ES5. We can use more modern, ES2015, um, to, to use some of those more recent JavaScript features. And of course, we can use TypeScript, is what I was chatting, uh, talking about earlier. So I'll choose TypeScript. Now it's going to launch us into creating a package.json. This is the same number of questions that it would ask you if you run npm init. So I'll just uh, hit enter a couple times, get to the end of that, and we'll see that it's already created a few files for me, and it's going to start installing the dependencies, that the project level dependencies that I want it to be installed. If I pop over to my uh, text editor to see what files it's actually laying down, we can kind of look at what's going on here. Um, the main thing that it's set up for us is this um, package.json file. It includes all of the dependencies that uh, we need for all the choices that we just made. So for example, you can see that it's installed um, TypeScript because I chose to do TypeScript. If I didn't choose to do that, it would have customized this pack. It would not have that, and it would have some ES 2015 packages. Also important is this grunt file. The generator uses grunt um, as a task runner, and it took that um, app direct, the Web App Builder root directory that I put in, and it has these two locations, one to the app that I want to actually modify, and then one to the client stem app directory. And so these are the two locations that any time um, the generator sees that, or the grunt task sees that I'm making a change to my code, it's automatically going to compile or transpile my code and push them out to these two locations. So no matter where I am in the builder, I'll be able to um, utilize the latest version of the widget. It's also put down a few other things, like this URC file saves out some of the settings that I chose, um, tsconfig to, um, this, these are all the settings that you need to transpile the TypeScript into the proper format that Web App Builder needs, um, tslint to help you lint your code, all that good stuff. So now that's finished running, um, and I, the next thing is to actually create a widget. So you can create as many widgets as you want in this environment that you've set up. So um, that's why we kind of have them as separate uh, generators and what, what's called a subgenerator. So to run the widget subgenerator, I'm going to say yo Esri app builder js colon widget. And that's going to run that widget subgenerator. This one, this series of, um, this will ask me a series of questions as well, but specific to the widget that I want to create. 
So it'll ask me what should my widget be named. I'll call it like test widget. It's gonna ask for a title, description, base class for what, what, uh, what class you wanna use for your CSS. And then it asks me what kind of features I want to use. Uh, these features are kind of similar to what's available to you in the manifest.json file. So like you can decide to have a locale file for translations or not, a CSS style um, or not, um, configuration, template. You can turn all these things off by pressing the space bar on and off. I'll just leave them all on for this, for this demo. Also, then it asks what would I like a settings page? That's the kind of settings configuration when you add the widget to an app, it pops you into that modal that has the settings page and it can scaffold that out if you'd like or not. For this I will choose yes. And then since the settings page is almost a sort of mini widget in itself, it asks similar questions for the settings page. Do I want a template, um, translation file, or CSS? So I'll leave those all turned on. And just like that, after those five or six questions, it's got enough information to create all these files for me. You can see it's created like 12 or 13 files um, with an example widget, all that I would have had to create by, by hand if I wasn't using this. So let's take a look at those files. Um, So here you can see it put, it put those files in a widgets folder and it just put the widget in there. Um, it created a widget.ts file specifically because we're using TypeScript, um, our template, our manifest, everything that kind of based on what we chose, it set up all those files for us. The next step is to actually run Grunt. So this is kind of all the stuff that I've said so far is kind of like the one time setup for your widget and um, now it's kind of on your day-to-day -day development. What will you do? Well, you'll come into here in the morning and hit type in grunt, and that's actually going to, oh yeah. That's actually going to um, run grunt in the background, which transpiles my code and monitors my code for any changes, and that's kind of the important part. But since it's run, um, we should be able to see this widget in Web App Builder already. Oh, I need to go. So this is the um, builder interface, and when I go into my uh, widgets tab, there's my test widget that I created. So it's already ready right there, and since I chose to have a settings page, uh, the settings page is uh, specced out there as well. And it's just a very, pretty simple widget. Let me zoom in a little. Um, all it has is some text. It has that service URL, you know, just an example setting, and that's about it. Um, Next, what we might want to do is do some development. So if I've got my widget open here, um, what I normally do is actually open, open the app um, as it, like in the preview mode, and make sure I um, turn on live reload. This is, a, um, this is a feature we added a year or two ago, that if you install the live reload plugin into your browser, it'll automatically uh, reload the page when when it sees any changes and when it's doing that transpiling. So maybe I'll go into my widget files and go into this HTML file and you know add some stuff or something, put some exclamation points. And if I switch to the to the command line, you can see that the grunt task is running in the background. It saw that there was some changes were made, and over here in my browser, those changes are already in place. Um, so I think really adding the addition of that live reload and making sure that, that that's all connected really allows you to do some more efficient developing um, and uh, you know get 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 your code written faster and and more successful. So that's basically the generator. Um, 
I hope you all use it. Um, one thing, one additional thing that I kind of wanted to mention was the TypeScript aspect. Um, like I said, it's something we introduced last year and we've really been kind of focusing on uh, the TypeScript support in the generator. Um, just because it seems like TypeScript is, has become really popular over the past few years, it's a superset of JavaScript, which means that it's all your plain old JavaScript code will be perfectly fine when it's compiled with TypeScript, but as you get used to the syntax, you can start using types and start using some of the syntax that TypeScript uses, um, and it'll allow you to kind of catch, your, catch some mistakes more, uh, more earlier in your development process and hopefully make you more, a more efficient developer. So I've, I've found that TypeScript has really been, uh, or with widget, gen, widget um, writing widgets has really been a great way to kind of get going with TypeScript. It's not, um, not super daunting. It's not like having to build a full app with TypeScript. You can kind of just try it out and see how you like in the context of a widget. So I'd encourage you to try that out. Um, I did want to show a few of the features that come with um, using TypeScript and the generator. Um, the first one is, I think, one of the keys, and it's um, autocomplete. So let's, uh, if I go over into my widget and um, maybe I add a div and I do my data dojo attach point, like we're all familiar with, and give it a name maybe instructions. Um, in the TypeScript, uh, you do have to kind of tell it about your widget template. So in here, I'm going to create a new, a new private uh, variable um, instructions, and I'm gonna tell that TypeScript that it's an HTML element. You'll see that because I'm using VS Code, I've already got um, autocomplete on all the types that I could assign to this variable. And so now my TypeScript knows that instructions is an HTML element that I can then use in the rest of my code. So let me pop down to the post create. And maybe I want to put, um, let's say I want to put like this, the current extent into that instructions DOM element uh, just, just for an example. So to do that I would do this dot instructions dot uh, inner HTML, and you can see that because TypeScript knows that there's an HTML element, it's um, auto-completing, um, and I can just say enter, and maybe I want to say this.sceneView, so this.sceneView is auto-completed for me, and, um, and that's good, right? No. No, we, we all know that the red underscore means bad. Um, so, but this is honestly a mistake that I've made, right? Like you, you sometimes, as a GIS developer, you might say, oh, this dot scene view, and you assume that that's gonna be the extent. But TypeScript knows that scene view is of type scene view and inner HTML is expecting a type of string. So instead of having to pop over to the browser and then realize that I screwed up and that I actually need to put um, dot extent, which here it is, it's gonna auto-complete for me. Um, it'll save me that time and I don't, don't have to kind of go through that development process. But yeah, I, I don't know if you saw that, but the auto-complete is really, really good um, with TypeScript when you're using the, when you install the proper typings, which the generator puts in for you. I can scroll through all the possibilities in terms of the properties and methods of, um, of scene view and you can see it even pulls in the documentation on the right. So all of our, what I've been doing for years and years, switching between my text editor and uh, developers.rxs.com, uh, maybe I don't have to do that as much anymore. I can just look at the documentation right in line and, uh, and, and keep my development going forward. So let me put in my extent. Um, and I'm still, I'm still redlined, right? Like, what's going on here? Well, extent is not a string either, so TypeScript is warning me that, you know, there's a problem right there. So I can just do dot two JSON maybe. And now finally TypeScript is telling me, like, yes, that, that, is, uh, that is acceptable. So another, another thing that we've changed um, over the, over the past year is the configuration. So your config.json is used by both um, your widget, uh, your widget file as well as your setting. And so it kind of makes sense and it's a very tight scripty thing to do um, to create an interface for that. 
Um, we did have the interface kind of in the widget.ts, but um, based on some community feedback and kind of some, some kind of obvious uh, TypeScript uh, knowledge, um, we should have that in a separate file. So that's what we have now. We have this config.ts that gets generated for you. So that like this, in our case, we've got service URL, which is a string. So I can go into both my main JavaScript code, if I do maybe console.log this.config.service URL, it'll auto-complete that for me here. Um, but I can also go into the setting.ts and basically do the same thing, this.config.service URL. And if I, um, say, change my configuration to be something else, service URL2, suddenly TypeScript is telling me that we've got problems. And it'll help me catch those errors, again, earlier on in the process so you can be more efficient as a developer. Um, so yeah, that's really all I have on TypeScript. That's really, it's just um, the, the not really digging too deep into TypeScript, but I really, uh, really have really enjoyed it doing widgets with TypeScript over the past year, and I hope you, you all can use the generator um, to use TypeScript or not um, in the next year. George? All right. Thanks, Kevin. You, uh, you want to hear a JavaScript joke? Yes. All right, I'll call back later. Do you promise? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, by the way, one other, uh, one other feature of the, the scaffolding tool Gavin's been talking about is the ability to build your web app builder applications. Uh, how many people here are currently building your web app builder applications before you send them out to production. Okay, so a good amount. Uh, if you aren't building your applications, I highly suggest you start, um, and we'll take a look at why here. So I'm gonna pull up a very simple web app builder application here. It's just the base application you get when you create a new 2D app. And I'm pretty sure you've all You've probably all had this experience before, but let's take a quick look at this. So this is what your users are seeing when they go to your app, right? How many people would go home or go to a different site if they went to this for just something they were interested in on the internet? Probably a lot of you. We can see it's still making requests right now. We're at 270 JavaScript files. It took about 18 seconds to load right here. Um, in modern web development, that's pretty rough. So if we go through, and I have another one open that's been run through that build process right here, and let's take a look at that one. And it's still, you know, it's not the fastest web app in the world, but right here we're already starting to see things. It's 22 JavaScript files that loaded, it's already up in a reasonable amount of time. You can see there is an error there, that's the, um, the projection engine isn't loading with the current build tool. So if you're doing widgets where you're reprojecting your map on the fly to something interesting, that's not just, you know, WGSA 4 versus Web Mercator sort of stuff, you might have problems and we can talk later, but I don't think that's a very common use case yet. Um, so we're working on getting everything squared away. But yeah, that's you know a full 10 seconds faster. That's a order of magnitude less of JavaScript calls, um, and a just significantly better user experience. Uh, as you add widgets, as you add dependencies, the uh, the difference you're going to see here is only going to get larger and larger and larger. So with the scaffolding, we actually add a build task right here, and you can see it's set up. The build task has to run on a complete Web App Builder application. So it's pointing to that application that you ran when you started that Web App Builder. And then all you have to do from the command line in your folder is type npm run build. I'm not gonna run it now. It's a, uh, it's a very CPU intensive process. It takes a significant amount of time to run. Uh, so don't run it on any production servers because it will hit your web performance. Um, but 
That being said, it's something you can stick into a pipeline before you push to production. It's something you could just run um, right before you move it to your web server, depending on how much you're doing DevOps. But either way, definitely a step to take. If we look at um, if we look at the tool here, this is a GitHub repo that we have set up. Uh, it's where the actual build tool lives. You don't need to use the scaffolder to use it, although we recommend it. Um, but this will allow you to run it in if you're using some other version or you have stuff up on in another repo, an existing web app builder app. Uh, and you can go through here and it'll give you installation instructions. You can run it from either the project itself with an NPM run build, or you can run it globally um, just on the system on your command line. We also have some hooks for scripting. So if you're writing build processes with, um, with Node, you can call functions directly to build what you want. And just do it. <laughs> so another piece of the puzzle here when we're doing talking development for a web app builder is how do I store my code in source control? I have this giant application. It has a lot of code I didn't write that I don't really care about, that I don't want to have to deal with changing when it upgrades, right? So we want to talk about best practices for a minute. If we look at what the Yeoman generator actually pushes out, we can see it only gives you a snippet of this, right? And it's copying everything over. That's what you want to store in source control. Like, you don't want to store every single widget in GitHub, right? You just want to store yours. And that way you can do things like combine multiple widgets from different repositories. You don't have to have every widget you've ever written in one piece. And you can automate that and script it to copy over using the tools that Gavin has helped to write. From there, we want to talk about actually developing. How do I do things like unit testing? How do I make my widgets more accessible in other applications that might not be Web App Builder? And in order to do that, we use a technique called, uh, that we call wrapping your widgets. And really what that is, is going to be installing or creating a JavaScript API widget. We're not going to be creating Web App Builder widgets anymore. We're JavaScript developers, we're not just web app developers, right? So we go through here and we look at the widget.js file. This isn't something that the scaffolder does for you, so it's something that you'll have to, you'll have to do yourself. But right here, we have a very basic application, or a very basic widget, and we want to keep it that way. So if we were going to create a new widget right now, I would go into widget.html and I would take away all these things that actually do stuff. And I would just put in a, uh, a new div, maybe a, a data dojo attach point. And I'm going to set it to main container. And it'll give me an access into my widget. Then here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new folder. And I'm going to call that dev summit widget. Inside there, we can make a couple new classes and kind of emulate this templated widget feel. So I'll say dev summit widget.js, and then I'll do another one for a template so that we can still get that nice widgeted behavior that we have. Dev summit widget, and then I can do things here if I really want to. I can say just a hello world type application, right? And I can in my widget.js, I can now load this. So we'll say main widget, and I'm going to import the, uh, the widget I just created. So this is using the ES2015 syntax. I wanted to show uh, something a little different, one of the other options. Uh, generally, I prefer TypeScript, but this is also a good option for giving you some of the more powerful features that are available with modern JavaScript. So I'm going to import dev summit widget, and you can see I'm already missing that autocomplete from dot slash dev summit widget slash dev summit widget. And now we have access to that widget. It's no longer a web app builder widget, it's something I can use anywhere. 
It's something I can test without having to load any Jimu containers or site managers or anything like that. None of the widget frameworks, it's much smaller weight. And then in my post create here, I can just say, okay, this dot main widget um, equals new dev summit widget. We can have some properties, like maybe we want it to know about the map. And maybe the base class. And we're just gonna use this as kind of a proxy to pass Web App Builder framework into my other widget. And that is going to go into this dot main container. So now if I did everything correctly here, uh, well it says task babble not found, so that's probably not gonna work out pretty well. Uh, but that would go ahead and it would create that widget and be an easier way to hook in. So a lot of people start with this idea and then they hit something that they wanna use from Web App Builder and they give up. They're like, well, no, I can't do this. I wanted to have it do something on open or I wanted to have it do something on maximize or, some, or sign out. So what we can do is it's not really that big a deal, right? We just still need this as a proxy. But instead of doing, um, instead of actually putting our logic in here, I'm just gonna go ahead and say this dot main widget dot on open. And now I can go into my dev summit widget and I can start writing an, a class here. So this is the wrong one. Let's look at what that looks like. This is, a, uh, this is a widget that we've written out earlier. Um, I'll give an example of where to find this on GitHub a little bit later. But we can see here it's a very basic widget that says navigate to Dev Summit. And then if I look at my widget.js, it's got that same thing where I'm just connecting to the scene view, I'm connecting to a few of the widgets that I want. So let's add something to on open. Fix our commas. I'm gonna say this dot main widget dot on open. And then from within my go to dev summit widget, I can say something like on open here. And I can do things like, you know, reset a counter or something you know, like this dot display message, I made it to Dev Summit, right? So that gives us now, you can see the only things this piece is pulling in. It's pulling in declare, widget base, templated mix in and template. And those are all things we know how to do, pr deal with pretty easily. Um, so now we can write unit tests. Uh, how many people here are currently writing unit tests? Okay, a couple. Uh, and how many people here are exclusively web app builder developers, like this is your primary way of pushing apps out to people. Okay, great. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to use some of the toolings that aren't coming from the web app builder community to create a simpler test experience where your testing doesn't have to rely on some of the, the uh, requirements that web app builder has. So let's just take a look at a sample test here. This test is, is just going to uh, make sure that we've called go to on the, uh, on the proper coordinates. We know Palm Springs is around here, so we're going to make sure that this, that option was called. You can see here this fake view class. So the reason I have a fake view class is we don't wanna test the Esri JavaScript API. Uh, if you were in my testing talk earlier, you probably heard me say that over and over and over again, but I really mean it. Um, the JavaScript API is tested, right? They write their own unit tests. We don't wanna have to worry about what state the map is in. We don't wanna have to worry about whether the graphics are firing off at the right time. We just wanna worry about our code and that we're doing the right thing. We'll leave the rest up to them. So I'm setting up my class here before each time a test is run, just creating a new one. But here I'm passing in the fake view now, so it's not an actual scene view. 
and then I'm just gonna run my test. So I have what's called a spy that'll let me know when my functions are called. Uh, this is a pretty popular testing library. It's called Sinon.js. Uh, it allows you to just keep track of functions and things that you faked a little more easily. I call the function I want test, and I'm just looking here to say, okay, I just expect this to be called once. That's one test condition. And then I wanna make sure that was called, whoops. I wanna make sure it was called with the right parameters. So I'm looking at the parameters it was called with, and I'm saying, putting some very clear messages, and that way, when people see something, when something goes wrong, someone breaks my widget, maybe someone else on my team, I can see exactly where in the code it broke, and I can do something to fix it. You know, it's, it's a pretty simple function right now, but as long as you stick to the premise of having really pure functions where your input is always gonna produce the same output, and you only test those functions, don't worry about the things that are setting up your UI that are doing things like that, you'll find it's really easy to start adding these unit tests, and if you just keep doing it as you fix bugs, as you add new functionality, you'll get a pretty sizable test space very quickly. Uh, that repo is up on GitHub here. It's a web test example, uh, and it has a, a readme here that describes some of the processes using this technology. Um, we're using Karma for the test runner here. That's just a system to get the tests actually run. Uh, I think it's a few years away from being trendy now, but you could use really anything you want with this pattern. You know, you could use the intern, you could use Jest, uh, whatever you're comfortable with or whatever your group is comfortable with at work. The really important thing with unit tests is that you make them easy to develop. Because if they're hard to develop, I guarantee you after the first week of writing code under a unit testing policy, not a single developer is gonna write a new unit test. <laughs> and it's always better to have a couple really well executed unit tests than it is to have none. All right, let's pull up the slides. Make sure I actually got to everything. All right, so some related talks that are gonna be going on tomorrow that you might wanna check out. Um, the tips and trips for debugging apps, and that's gonna be at 10 a.m. We have uh, web editing. I know a lot of people are using web editing with uh, Web Builder. This is kind of an alternative way to look at it in the JavaScript API 4.x, see how they're doing it. You know, it's always good to explore all the different ways you can approach a solution. Uh, another one that's worth checking out that we didn't put on here, but I think everyone would like is, uh, I believe the JavaScript API, the road ahead is the first session of the day tomorrow. So, you know, if you're feeling all right after the party tonight, definitely worth it. <laughs> uh, we also have a, a recording here. All of the recordings from Dev Summit for the past few years are up on YouTube. Uh, check them out. It's really great knowledge. I go through and look up topics on there all the time. Uh, just some of the resources we used. This is the GitHub page for the widget generator. Again, that's how I start every single thing I develop with Web App Builder. It's really a lifesaver. Uh, and the build tool that gets automatically integrated with that. And then we have that quick unit testing example that we talked about. Finally, we just have some articles here. You know, the, one of the great things about Web App Builder, and I think why people are drawn to it so much, is the great community around it. Um, you know, people share their widgets pretty regularly. There's a lot of great blog posts. I know I pull widgets off of GeoNet pretty frequently. So, you know, feel free to go out there and see what other people are doing before you start developing. It's especially helpful. Yeah, the worst, the worst feeling in the world is like when you spend like hours developing a custom widget and then you find out that someone already posted something very, very similar out there and you're like, oh, I wish I would have checked that first. Um, so yeah, definitely search and there's, there's some resources. You can get the, you'll be able to get the slides on, on GitHub after, after this. Yep, and along those lines too, you know, um, we have our tools up on GitHub, 
So if you're working with it, you see problems, definitely go in, put some issues in. Uh, we'll try to get to them. I know sometimes we can, uh, we can seem kind of quiet on that front, but we do accept pull requests. <laughs> so if you're feeling enterprising and you have a need, we'll definitely take a look at your code and integrate it in. Uh, just some documentation, we always need documentation. And that's it, so. Before we go, uh, I was in the bar last night and uh, George, George walks in and asks for 1.4 root beers. The bartender says, I'll have to charge you extra, that's a root beer float. And George said, in that case you better make it a double. <laughs> that's all we got, thanks guys.